The first word in English for man-made things that fly was aircraft in 1851. It referred to airships and balloons. Aeroplane was first recorded in English in 1873, a borrowing from French in reference to gliders, and now considered archaic by the French. The French Academy soon replaced aeroplane with a more impressive sounding avion, which better collocates with aviation and aviateur, or aviatrice for a woman. Aeroplane was anglicised to airplane by 1907. This occurred in Britain and was picked up in standard American English soon after. The British soon reverted back to aeroplane and Americans continued to use airplane. The first fighter planes were referred to by the British press as battle planes to correlate with battleship. This uh, obviously did not catch on. It was the airplane that would decide any future war. Victory would go to the nation that could dominate the skies. The 20th century was to see a shift in global British linguistic, military and economic hegemony to that of the ascending and increasingly self-confident United States. The US became the world's largest economy around 1910. It would be the uh, people of the United States that would shape the future of the English language as her military would dominate global conflicts and shape the face of war. Some of the words in this video may seem somewhat old-fashioned, more so than words in previous videos. This is because the older words have become cemented and frozen in English. They are the survivors in the ever-changing nature of language. As we get closer to the present day, we encounter words that may be on their way out. Expressions such as our pogey bait for candy, one over the eight for drunk, and the hackneyed uh, expression, the balloon goes up, demeanor foreboding, are expressions of our military or origin of this period. They may still be uh, recognizable to uh, older viewers, but will confound younger ones. Unless they are somehow repopularized, they will die out. The First World War was a truly global conflict. However, most of the words included in this uh, video came from the Western Front. With the assassination of the heir to the Austrian-Hungarian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Austria-Hungary was allied with Germany and Serbia was allied with Russia. It was uh, enough to trigger decades of tension between the two blocs. War ensued. The month of August in 1914 saw 13 separate declarations of war in Europe. Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary, commented, The lights are going out all over Europe, and we shall not see them lit again in our lifetimes. This European civil war would turn global and reach its tragic climax in 1945. World leaders had decided it was a good idea to play a macabre game of death on an unprecedented scale. The world wars caused more human misery than any other event in history before or since. The Western Front was created when both sides made repeated attempts to outflank each other, creating a gradual expanding trench line from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Once the trenches of the Western Front were dug and um, each side faced off, the German soldiers were nicknamed the Bosch. There were several theories as to where this came from but nothing can be proven. The most likely explanation is that Bosch is a French slang word for scoundrel. Another theory suggests it may have come from the Eastern French dialect word for a German, Alamosch, to which Bosch was derived. An 1887 French slang dictionary had an entry for German that read Tete de Bosch. In this 1887 sense, Bosch was probably a derivation of caboche, meaning cabbage. So let the viewer be the judge of that. It was the French that bore the brunt of the early fighting on the Western Front. Triage dates back to uh, 1727 to refer to uh, sorting out of separate objects according to their quality, most commonly, most commonly referring to food items such as uh, coffee beans. By 1914, the term was archaic and barely recognisable. Originally a French borrowing, triage was reappropriated and used in English exclusively to refer to the newly adopted practice of prioritizing the treatment of wounded soldiers. This was a life-saving improvement on practices prior to the First World War, where treatment of the wounded was uh, conducted strictly on the basis of um, the order in which they reached the hospital or the doctor. Another medical-related uh, expression for World War I used to articulate the physical condition of soldiers is to push up daisies. The Swedish government remained neutral during the conflict, to which uh, consecutive Swedish governments have done since the uh, Napoleonic Wars. However, not all Swedes agreed with this. Different sections would sympathize with each side in this conflict, and Germany put pressure on the Scandinavian pacifist nation for support. The Swedish government permitted the Germans to lay mines in Swedish waters. 
There were active support for um, the abandonment of the neutrality in favour of Germany. Both sides watched developments closely as Swedish involvement may have been a deciding influence. Those advocating on the side of Germany were referred to by the British media as activists. The men on the front engaged in a sort of activism or inactivism of their own. Uh, the rank and file of both sides mutually deduced that if they were to refrain from shooting at the people on the other end of um, no man's land, as it was quickly named, their opposite number would also refrain from shooting back. This understanding among the men on the Western Front was known as live and let live. Nobody wanted to die, and no man in particular wanted to be the first to do so. Prior to a sophisticated anti-German propaganda campaign thoroughly demonising their pointy-helmeted opponents, most of the men in the trenches did not like or dislike the Germans any more or less than the French troops they were standing beside. Some would have preferred to aim their weapons at the French instead. Winston Churchill was First Lord of the Admiralty in 1915. In this role, he requested that the army develop a machine or some mechanical uh, solution in order to break the stalemate on the trenches. His suggestion fell on deaf ears, and as head of the navy, he didn't have any influence of what the army did on the battlefield. Churchill was nonetheless undeterred. He commissioned tests of steamroller-like vehicles in London. Churchill's vision and direction was fanciful, but the engineers solved most of the practical problems. The project was stymied when the Gallipoli disaster cost Churchill his position. The Navy found it hard to progress, and a project that was clearly within the purview of the Army without uh, Churchill's influence. Nonetheless, Churchill continued to push the idea behind the scenes. Despite the difficulties, uh, prototypes were made. Due to the secrecy of the project, the new contraptions were labelled water tanks to hide their true purpose and to create a cover story that the vehicles were being built to supply fresh drinking water in the field. As it was the Admiralty who developed these contraptions, nautical words were used to describe its features hatch, turret, hull and deck. They soon went into mass production and were first used in 1918 with initial success, mostly as a result of the fear they instilled, as well as ushering in the era of the tank. Churchill, a talented writer, a coiner of words, and always ready with a witticism, is credited with coining the word seaplane around the same time. However, as with many famous people, he didn't say all the things he said. Soldiers in the trenches made their own words for the new, deadly, and unedifying things they encountered. As both sides hurled artillery at each other, different artillery pieces could be identified by the unique sounds they made. One particular piece of German artillery was dubbed a whiz bang by 1915 because it went a whiz and, you guessed it, it went bang. Enlisted soldiers appropriated an old piece of legal terminology for the duration to refer to their time in the trenches. The repetitive and monotonous nature of trench life was articulated by um, terms such as upteen and upteenth, derived from an older slang word uh, umpty, meaning a big number. When the uh, British came under chemical weapon attack, th this chemical that was used by the Germans was dubbed mustard gas, based on its smell. Although the effects were horrific and tragic on its victims, successfully implemented countermeasures ensured that such gas attacks would not result in large numbers of casualties. To be reprimanded by an officer was to be ticked off. The men called the Western Front the Great Sausage Machine. A bonk was a hard thumping sound, the uh, sexual sense states from the 1970s. The first trench coats were worn by British officers, who dubbed them as such by 1916. Burberry was commissioned to provide the coats to keep the officers warm in winter. The design has changed very little since then. In the trenches, British soldiers heard the German slogan, Gott straf England, which means may God punish Britain. The German uh, poet, uh, better described as a scribe, uh, scribbler of hateful propaganda, Ernst Lissauer, is widely attributed to have coined the phrase Gottstrave England. This phrase was also painted onto the walls of the buildings in the towns that the British soldiers would subsequently op occupy. They picked up the word uh, strafe and used it for all kinds of military attacks and manoeuvres. The current meaning of shooting up an enemy position from a low-flying aircraft was attested by 1942. When a lot of uh, artillery would come their way, the concentrated artillery fire was said to be a barrage, based on the French phrase uh, tir de barrage, meaning a wall of fire. Previously, the word in English referred to a kind of man-made barrier in a stream. The uh, war was the first to see both soldiers and equipment make a concerted effort to blend into the background. 
All kinds of attire, nets and foliage covered hats appeared. Ships were painted with a, a kind of disorientating uh, zebra stripe pattern in order to confuse the enemy targeting their vessel. Initially such designs were referred to as a dazzle painting, first by the British Navy. The British uniforms proved to possess the most effective shade of khaki to blend in with their surroundings. British soldiers picked up the French term uh, camouflage, which was a Parisian slang at the time to mean disguise. It was first recorded in an August 1917 edition of Popular Science Monthly. By wars and the British, French and American armies all established a special units dedicated entirely to camouflage and concealment. Unlike the distant colonial wars of pre the previous century, the British people were not immune to the hardships. War was no longer something that happened in faraway places. Both our soldiers and civilians were subject to rationing. German Zeppelin bombs and naval bombardment attacks on the British island in order to attack factories and, and the workers that worked in them, mostly women, that manufactured the necessities of war. These are Zeppelins were dubbed baby killers and nicknamed blimps by 1916. While many uh, theories exist as to why blimp was chosen, no c credible explanation exists. The most common theory is that it was coined by uh, aviator Horace Short, a variation of limp. This is a uh, Unlikely, and the origin of blimp remains a mystery. Female munition uh, factory workers were dubbed the uh, canaries due to the yellow complexion. In addition to severe jaundice, the conditions in the factories caused uh, things like, such as uh, bilious attacks, uh, blurred vision and depression. One woman's black hair even turned green. The conditions in the factories killed our hundreds by the uh, accidental detonation of munitions and the TNT fumes. Given the static nature of the conflict, the word front was used to refer to the location where each side would assemble and systematically kill each other. The uh, effort and, and the danger was first referred to as home front by 1917. As the price of food went up and its availability went down, food suppliers were dubbed war profiteers. The resentment was justifiable as many traders and suppliers conspired to manipulate supply in order to drive up prices. By 1917, anti-German propaganda was in full swing. The royal family changed its name from the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha to something more fittingly British, the House of Windsor. Anything German was despised. City councils changed German sounding streets to uh, more acceptable English sounding ones. Kennel clubs all over Britain stopped using the term German Shepherd to refer to the breed of sheepdog originating in Germany. The term Alsatian was adopted instead. The name was taken from the province of Alsace, although the German Shepherd Alsatian breeder dog has no actual connection with the Alsace region. Lenin and a group of followers were imposed back into Russia with German connivance. German officials organized a sealed carriage to ensure they arrived safely, knowing that the uh, political agitation the group would cause could only work in Germany's favor. Upon arrival, he led the Bolshevik Revolution, overthrowing the provisional government that had overthrown the Russian monarchy nine months earlier. As Lenin seized power in November 1917, he called for an armistice the next day and quickly moved to end Russian involvement in the war, as the Germans had hoped. Throughout the war, the Russian military suffered from low morale and poor leadership and struggled to maintain discipline. Incredibly, however, they managed to hold the line. Germany was also buckling under the weight of the British naval blockade of the North Sea. According to the German government, the blockade caused 730,000 German deaths. Like all wartime death tallies of civilians, the figure is highly unreliable and susceptible to the propaganda of the day. In times of war, the blame for one's own lack of planning and administration can easily be attributed to the enemy. With both sides more weary, Russia eventually agreed to, the, to a conditional surrender in March 1918. The Entente ceased to exist. This left Britain, France, Italy and by now the United States to fight Germany. With uh, Russia being on one side of Germany and Britain's remaining allies to the West, the West, as a reference to this new geopolitical bloc, was first recorded in 1918. The United States declared war on Germany in 1917, but didn't arrive in large numbers until 1918. Raising an army and crossing the Atlantic took time. By the standards of the day, it was a good effort. The US Army insisted on operational independence, and they brought with them their own terminology. 
Details of military maneuvers or operations were often secret or not yet decided. If the time of any maneuver could not be mentioned during the planning stage, it was referred to as H hour. If the day could not be mentioned, it was referred to as D-Day. The planned invasion of France during World War II was much awaited and much delayed. The anticipation and importance of this particular D-Day solidified its association with the now well-known historical event on June 6, 1944. Active American participation on the Western Front lasted for about uh, 200 days. War causes all sorts of misery, large and small. Whether you were late for a meal and missed out, or whether you were killed, this kind of thing was referred to by the Americans by the initials SLL, which uh, stood for shit out of luck. American soldiers stationed in Belgium are also credited for naming a local dish of fried potato strips as uh, French fries. The expression complemented and uh, eventually replaced the American expression uh, French fried to mean deep fried. This is the likely reason the dish was not dubbed uh, Belgian fries, together with the fact that the official language of the Belgian army was French. The dish itself was a local speciality. The villagers living near the river Meuse would eat uh, fried fish caught from the river. During the winter, the river would freeze over. So these people deprived of fish, they would uh, fry strips of potatoes instead. French fried potato straws or batons were not unique to this area and already featured in the American culinary experience. The war just gave them a new name. The US Navy also had its lingo, whose sailors uh, utilized the term whole ass, or whole ass, as in my best American, to refer to a hasty departure originating around uh, 1918. At the beginning of the conflict, the airplanes of the Royal Flying Corps were chiefly used for aerial reconnaissance. Later, they engaged in dogfights. Only during the final stages of the battles of the Western Front did they uh, find their combat utility. When airplanes of this vintage were stalled, they would make a sudden clunking sound that uh, sounded like the word uh, conk. Conk was a slang term for nose, and to conk someone was to punch them right on the conk. By 1918, if there was a sudden breakdown, it was said to conk out. An airplane that conked out, or was shot down in flames, typically nosedived, in an attempt to counter the disastrous effect of disease on soldiers. Soldiers were stripped, covered with a powdered pesticide, and sprayed with a hose. The purpose was to kill lice, or de-louse, the soldier. Lice uh, were a constant menace, and various methods of uh, de-lousing were tried and utilized. Everything from uh, candle wax to highly toxic chemicals were tried. As unpleasant as these treatments were, the soldiers of the Western Front were the first in history to benefit from some understanding of bacteriology, the importance of hygiene on the battlefield, and the use of antiseptics and inoculations. Panic Stations was first recorded in a November 1918 Times article. The article uh, detailed life on board the Q-ship HMS Prize. A Q-ship was a naval vessel disguised as something else, such as a civilian cargo or passenger ship. Some were even our sailboats, chosen for their dissimilarity to naval vessels. The hulls of these ships were loaded with wood or empty casks, making them almost unsinkable. The Q ships were disguised with uh, features such as dummy funnels and uh, collapsible shelters. The vessel could withstand a mine or a torpedo hit, which in turn would lure a German submarine out into the open, believing the vessel was no longer to be a threat. The submarine was then uh, susceptible to attack. This deception needed to be maintained until the U-boat or submarine was close enough to attack. The crew would be divided into two, the Navy men, who would stay to fight the German vessel, and the deckhands, engineers and stokers. The Navy men were the uh, action party, and the rest were referred to as the panic party. The panic party would proceed to abandon ship, just as a crew of any other civilian ship would do so. The Navy men would go into action stations, and when they given the signal, the panic party would go to panic stations, and then proceed to abandon ship as if it were about to sink. Observing the feigned panic on board would help convince the Germans that the Q-ship was harmless and entice it to approach further. Once the German vessel was in range of the Q-ship guns, hatches, flaps, screens and dummy deck houses concealing the ship's guns would come down. The white ensign of the Royal Navy would be raised and the Navy men would open fire. The panic party was often involved in recovering survivors. Q-ships were also used to sneak up on German vessels, often flying flags of neutral countries. It could quickly reveal hidden guns and attack instantly. The ultimate assessment of the World War I Q-ships must however be a failure. They only sunk about a dozen German naval vessels in total and became uh, ineffective after 1917 when Germany started waging unrestricted naval warfare. 
any suspicious vessel was attacked on site, regardless of ensign. The West would eventually win the war, but both sides were exhausted and on the brink of defeat right up until the end. German lines were only broken during the final months of the war. Meanwhile, Britain was running short of food and was on the verge of bankruptcy. Pacifists and other opponents of the war were making their voices heard. They were uh, disparagingly referred to with the French borrowing defeatists and more contemptuously as conchies, short for a conscientious objector. Defeatist as an adjective quickly followed, such as a defeatist argument and so on. The British forces dominated the western battlefields in 1918. They had the freshest and most aggressive men from Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand. The soldiers from the Dominions were able to make the difference between victory and defeat. One in five New Zealand males participated in the war, the highest rate of participation of all the belligerents. The Anzacs earned a reputation for combat competence and high morale and carried over a reputation for mayhem and indiscipline from the Boer War. The war finally got the better of the Germans. An armistice was agreed to and went into effect 11 a.m. November 1918. Military maneuvers continued until the very minute the ceasefire went into effect. The victors imposed crippling war reparations on the defeated German nation. Jerry, a name for the Germans, was first recorded in 1919, but undoubtedly used during the war. The name may have been in reference to the German soldier's distinctive helmet. At the time, Jerry was a slang term for chamber pot. Another colloquialism that appeared shortly after the war, the same year, was a to pull rank. The term shell shock was used in 1915 to describe patients overcome with the trauma of war, in particular to reference to the constant noise of mortar fire. The term was inadequate to describe the variety and complexity of what would now be termed as a, as a severe form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Shell shock has fallen out of regular usage, but shell shocked has survived as a common expression to articulate anyone who is stupefied or extremely surprised by anything. Such patients were more colloquially known as basket cases in American English by 1919. It was said that uh, basket weaving was a treatment for shell shock and other psychological effects of the war. The US military has always denied that such treatments were ever existed. The treatment uh, features in many books and films about the First World War. With the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the peoples of the Balkan region could create their own separate nation states. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Albania, Bulgaria and Romania became separate countries. This separation process was reported by the media as the balkanization of the region. The origin of the phrase is unclear, but it was certainly in use by 1919 in The Observer. The editor, James Lewis Garner, is said to have coined the phrase. This is disputed, but he and The Observer certainly popularized the term and defined its modern usage. The term balkanized soon followed. We view the uh, First World War as ending in 1918, when the major European powers called it off. However, conflicts around the world that spawned from this war in Europe continued until around uh, 1923.